right. Well, good morning, everybody. Good to see you out today. Happy Father's Day to all our dads out there in our auditorium, those who are watching on our Facebook page. We hope uh, you'll have a great day today, and we're so thankful for each and every one of you. Well, we are back in our uh, gymnasium again, and uh, we're starting to figure out that we can come back and we're going to be okay. A lot of folks have been, been trickling back in and some, some folks have been coming back today that weren't here previous. And we just want to encourage you, if you're feeling okay, if you don't have any uh, issues, health issues, um, come on back. You know, we have our face masks and uh, we're six feet apart. We're doing all things to keep us safe and we hope that you'll be back with us real soon, even next week. Alrighty. Well, we are uh, so thankful for uh, the opportunity to have services sometimes you know uh, uh, we kind of take the services for granted until they're taken away from us and I know for many weeks it was uh, it was lonely next door as we did our services and so good to be back and see our people again and, and uh, you know have a service with uh, with God's people Alrighty, so that's uh, some things that are uh, looking forward to our service here today pastor John's gonna come and we're gonna start our service off with a song All right, would you please stand? And we'll be singing 143. Sometimes we get discouraged about everything in the world, but we have to remember that God is our creator, the sustainer, and he is in control. We'll sing, This is My Father's World. Absolutely nothing. 
nothing, nothing is too difficult for thee. Amen. All right, that's good singing. You may be seated. Nothing is too difficult for thee. Are you praying that we'll have an end to this pandemic pretty soon? Are you getting a little tired of it? I think we all are. We've been tired for, for many weeks, actually, of the whole thing. But, um, you know, we trust that God is doing something. We trust that God is working through all the inconveniences and uh, all the, the sickness and everything that's been happening in the world. And uh, it's not just our church or our community or our country that's been affected. It's, it's the entire world. And we, we read missionary letters and see what they're doing. And they're doing the same thing we're doing. They're, they're online. They're doing the same thing with uh, with their people concerning uh, having services. So uh, everybody's had to adjust and change and, and do things differently. But, uh, you know, it's it's, uh, it's, it's going to work, and uh, people are still getting saved. People are, their lives are still being affected by the gospel. New people are being reached. We've, we've reached people on Facebook that we've never reached before, people that either used to be in our church and moved away, or people that didn't even know about our church and somebody invited them to watch. Uh, we've had visitors come, you know, that have, uh, uh, even recently that watched us on Facebook. So it's, it's, it's an outreach, a different outreach. We're not used to this type of outreach, but, uh, uh, you know, God has, uh, has ways sometimes that are above our ways and does things that we don't always understand. But I hope that you are praying. I hope that you are asking the Lord to bring uh, an end to this uh, soon. All righty, just a few announcements. At 10 o'clock this past uh, week, uh, of course, every week, but uh, this, this uh, 10 o'clock, an hour or so ago, we had our latest kids' video. We had a video about Mary and Martha, and uh, we have so much fun putting together these videos. Uh, when we go back to our regular junior churches, and the kids will, you know, they'll, they'll have their teaching again and have their singing and all their programs. This kind of something that helps them kind of uh, fill the gaps and, until we get back to some sort of regular schedule again with our kids. So. Encourage your kids to watch it. Sit down as an old family and watch it. And uh, even if you don't have any kids, you can watch it anyhow. You'll enjoy the puppets and the singing and everything. And uh, I'm, I'm uh, learning how to write skits. I'm learning. I learned a lot, you know, really in these, these last few few months here that I never knew before. But anyhow, uh, a few other announcements. Uh, Wednesday night, of course, we'll be back in church next door, 7 o'clock. And I uh, invite you to come out to that. We've been having more people come out for our Wednesday night service also. But uh, you know, we're, we have smaller crowds, so we're at next door in the auditorium. We can seat everybody there. And uh, we've been looking at the book of Isaiah, been looking through some great passages in Isaiah. So come on out on Wednesday night. Hey, this past uh, Friday evening, our kids, Concord Christian Academy, uh, had our graduation service right here. We had nine seniors graduate. They gave speeches, pre-recorded speeches. They uh, received their diploma, they got their pictures taken to, you know, to uh, invite family and friends. Uh, unfortunately, we were limited to how many people we could have, so each, each uh, graduate had their own section of, of people, and uh, we had a great time. So that was this past Friday. If you didn't get to see it, it's in our, on our Conquer Christian Academy's Facebook page, not our church, but our school Facebook page, and uh, you can watch the, uh, the whole service online there. All righty. Also, uh, want to remind you that uh, Concord Christian Academy is enrolling for next year. We're planning on having classes in school. And, uh, you know, we, uh, of course, had, like all other schools, had to shut down early and do everything online. But we're looking forward to getting back into classrooms again. Now, our, our uh, summer camp is underway. Um, kids have been coming out for that. We're, some of our classrooms are already filled up. This is for kids three that are potty trained all the way up through uh, uh, five-year-olds. If they're not potty trained, they go next door to the, uh, uh, to the nursery next door. But uh, both are open for, uh, it's not just essential works. Anybody can bring their kids and put them in. So if you're working, you just need a break. You know, you've had all your kids in the last uh, few months and you just need to, you know, get back to some sort of normal life. Uh, send them here. We're, we're, we're uh, taking care of them. And uh, if you need more information, if you call our church or our school, or visit our website and get more information about that. Alrighty, happy Father's Day. Dads, good to see all the dads out today. And I, I mentioned last week that because Mother's Day, uh, we didn't have anybody. I had a couple people out, you know, they were helping me with the video, but we didn't have anything on Mother's Day. It was, it was the, you know, the most dismal adult Mother's Day service I ever did. But, you know, we still preached and still had a service and you got to watch it online. But 
you know, I didn't get to see the moms. We didn't get to have them stand up. We didn't get to uh, give gifts out. And so since the moms didn't get a gift, dads, guess what? You don't get a gift either. But anyhow, uh, uh, you know, who needs another pen, right? Although those pens were great. We gave out. I, I, I still use them. They do everything but write, you know. But uh, anyhow, dads, we'll get you next year. Um, but I, I do want to just read some things, and we're going to show a video about our dads here today. Uh, this was written by Paul Maxwell. He said, everyone loves dad. Even the most broken relationships stand on a deep, unshakable hope for reconciliation. When we see the very best fatherly relationships, we can't help but be moved. Uh, there's so much stuff of life that comes from the joy of having a father, such as dad wisdom, dad jokes, dad genes, dad protection, dad love. When movies want to make us cry, they help us to experience an intimate moment between a father and a son or a daughter. When movies uh, want to make us uh, motivated, they show us a dad who kicks into action uh, the, the, to protect the family. Think of every 80s movie. Uh, and also Father's Day is a beautiful opportunity to celebrate the deep God-given desire to respect, impress, and follow honorable men in our lives. There are men who have helped shape us invested in us, been patient with us, and given us the love and stability we have needed uh, to become mature and competent adults. As you prepare for this day, reflect upon and use uh, what the Bible says about fathers to enrich your appreciation for your dad and older men in your life uh, who have helped you uh, to become the, uh, the person you are. Alrighty, and we are going to show now a, a little video about dads, and so Hope that you'll enjoy that. Thank you, Dad. Would you please stand again with us? And we'll be singing, My Jesus, I Love Thee. We may love our earthly fathers, but we need to love our Heavenly Father as well.
To uh, James chapter 3 this morning. We have been looking at uh, some great passages of scripture out of the book of James. A very practical book, a very convicting book. Uh, things that uh, we've heard and learned and things that we shall learn can help us become the men and women that we need to be. And today being Father's Day, this the message really ties in uh, with dads because as we look at James chapter uh, 3, and verse number 13, we read, Who is a wise man and a dude with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, uh, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. The question that's posed in verse number 13 is the title of the message this morning, Who is a wise man? Dads, hopefully uh, we can be wise men. Hopefully everybody, dads, moms, everybody, young people, we can all become wise people. And that's what we're going to look at this morning, how to have true godly wisdom that comes from above. Let's ask the Lord's blessing. Father, thank you today for this celebration of fathers. Thank you, Lord, for every dad that's here and that dad will be watching on the service. And uh, Lord, we know that uh, many godly dads have formed... Uh, uh, you know, the foundation for their family. And uh, we thank you for each and every one. We pray, Lord, for dads, maybe they're struggling, maybe dads that are not spiritual, maybe dads that are not saved. I pray, Lord, that you touch their heart and show them the love of Christ, show them the love of their heavenly Father. And then, Lord, I pray that uh, each and every one of us will seek after wisdom. Help us, Lord, to be truly wise men and women of God. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Father's Day is uh, usually a kind of a, a, a mixed bag of things and, and kind of depending where you are in life. I know my dad died uh, 15 years ago, 2005, so uh, Father's Day kind of has, has not been the same as what it used to be. Uh, you know, get him a gift, give him a call, let him know how much I uh, appreciated him. Uh, and so therefore, uh, you know, for those of us who've lost our fathers, uh, Father's Day kind of is just not the same. I know some of you have even lost your fathers uh, recently, and it's, it sometimes becomes a, a kind of a bittersweet day. Uh, others are fathers, and uh, your kids, you know, have looked up to you or have uh, got your card or a, a gift or, or something maybe to, to show that they appreciate you. But sometimes... Uh, you, there's good fathers out there. Sometimes there's bad fathers, unfortunately. There's dads who have raised their kids and have led their family spiritually. There's other dads who have been deadbeat dads and have not done anything and maybe just fathered a child and that's it and have not been, uh, you know, not been in that, that child's life. And so, you know, Father's Day means something basically to everybody, you know, based on your, your circumstances in life. But uh, what I'm going to share today, of course, is... Uh, how that fathers, in particular, need to have wisdom. I read to you Proverbs chapter 23, verse 24. It says this, um, The father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice, and he that begetteth a wise child shall have joy in him. Dads, one of the greatest things we can do is have wise children. Children that took maybe things that we taught them. I like the dad jokes. I can really appreciate, you know, I can really identify with that. You know, my kids, oh, dad, you're so corny. 
you know, uh, you know, say the same stupid things, do the same dumb things all the time. Uh, but that was our little thing. It was just a way in which we, we you know, communicated and, and enjoyed one another. Uh, so I appreciated that. Uh, but uh, as we, we think about dads, we, we understand dads that we, first off, want to be wise so that we can pass on wisdom so that our kids, as they grow up, they can be wise also. Uh, none of us want kids that grow up to be rebels. None of us want kids that grow up to be, uh, you know, drug addicts or drunks or, you know, uh, atheists or people that really don't contribute to society at all. We always want the best for our kids. We want our kids to take what we've given them. And, uh, and we pass along these things. There's many things I learned from my dad. And I, we grew up in a, in a home that was religious. We were not saved, though, to be honest. Uh, we, we knew about God. We knew about Jesus. We didn't understand what salvation was all about. But they did the best they could to, to rear me and, and to put me in a school that, that taught me religion and do the things uh, that I needed to, to have. I was protected. I was cared for. Uh, my dad never made a lot of money, but we always had a nice house because he was uh, he built houses. You know, uh, he, he always. Uh, was there for me whenever I had a problem, an issue, I could always go to him, I could always share with him my heart, and I, I appreciate uh, the wisdom and the, the guidance that, uh, that he gave me. I remember when I was a kid, I was 12 years old, my dad uh, introduced me to work. You know, I, I'm only a kid, only 12 years old, I thought you're supposed to play, have fun, go play wiffle ball, go to the park, you know, ride your bike. First summer, uh, that, that uh, at age 12, my dad said, all right, you're old enough to come to work with me. Now he needed laborers. You know, he needed somebody to mix mortar, carry bricks, and carry shingles, and do these things. And so at, at age 12, he introduced me to work. He introduced me to calluses on my hands. He introduced me to sore muscles and sore backs. And I was a scrawny little squirt of a kid. You know, I could, you know was, was small, was short, was... Uh, underweight, and, and, and I tell you what, you know, uh, I, all of a sudden I had to get stronger. I, I was going to be left behind. I was looking at the scaffolding back there. It reminded me of the days we set up scaffolding and planks and, and bad memories. But anyhow, I appreciate that. I appreciated that. It's a, not, you know, every summer, you know, I'd work for him and uh, all the way up until I went off to college. But um, it gave me a work ethic. It showed me uh, what you have to do someday in life. That life is not about riding a bike or just playing baseball, unless you're a professional baseball player or a professional cyclist. But uh, it, it's about work. It's about working hard. It's about being responsible. It's about doing the things every day, showing up whether you want to or not. Working hard all day, earning money. It's, it's, it, it showed me what life was all about. And I appreciated that. As uh, we look at the Word of God, we see that dads, we need to do things that will teach our kids what life is all about. And as we receive wisdom, we're, we're, our goal is to try to give them the wisdom that we've learned over the years. Proverbs 4, 7 says this, wisdom is the principal thing, and with all thy getting, get understanding. Get wisdom, get understanding. The, uh, of course, the writer of Proverbs was Solomon, the wisest man in the world. He sits down with his son. He pens down all these wonderful proverbs for us to understand, to teach us, to show us about life, to show us about every aspect of, of what we need to experience and how we need to respond. And now we come to the book of James. And James too, uh, like the book of Proverbs, talks to us about wisdom, teaches us about wisdom. Now our theme for this, this uh, whole series is called Real Faith. And if you're going to have real faith, you have to have real wisdom. And if you're going to show forth your faith, you have to have this spirit of wisdom so that when people look at you, they don't think you're a nut. They don't think you're a fool. They don't think your religion is worthless. They don't think that your faith is worthless. And so when you show forth wisdom, it is a great testimony of your faith in Jesus Christ. Because is not Jesus the wisest? The Bible says he was one greater than Solomon. Every time somebody came and tried to catch Jesus in, in, in words that they could use against him, he always had the right answers. He always responded with wisdom. He always did the right thing. And so if we're followers of Jesus, we have to glean the wisdom that Jesus had and say, Lord, help me to be wise just like Jesus was. And so we, uh, we look at this book now 
and we ask ourselves the question, who is a wise man? Ask yourself the question, am I wise? Now, of course, most of us, oh yeah, I'm wise. You know, a lot of us are maybe wise guys, but you know, are we wise men? Are we wise people? Sometimes we think a little more highly of ourselves than what other people think. Are we wise? Now, what's the other end of the spectrum? A fool. And, and probably everybody is in between, somewhere between a perfect wise man and a perfect fool. You know, we all fit somewhere in between uh, that, that spectrum there. And so as we ask ourselves a question, am I wise? We're going to go to the book of James, and we're going to see what James says on how to, uh, you know, what you're going to have to have in your life in order to be a wise man. Let me ask you a question. Do you want to impact your family? Do you want to impact your kids? Do you want to impact uh, the people around you that you work with? Do you want to impact your neighborhood? Do you want to impact your community? You see, if every one of us impacts our little world, then the world as a whole is impacted. And so the ones that are going to impact your family many times is going to be the leader, dad. The one that's going to help the family to be the, the, you know, the, the, the right type of family, it's going to start with dad. Now, I know moms have a lot of wisdom, and in fact, many times much more than dads. But, but the dad has been called to be the spiritual leader, and so therefore, if you don't have wisdom, you better get it real quick. And if you're lacking wisdom, we're going to show you today how you can get every ounce of wisdom you need to have in life. And so I want us to look at three things this morning. The first thing that I share with you today is this. Wisdom produces good actions. Wisdom produces good actions. We look at the verse again in verse 13. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. Now, if you remember the previous messages, we talked about faith without works is dead, right? What's real religion? Going out there, taking care of the fatherless, taking care of the widows in need, uh, uh, guarding your mouth, things like that. And so our faith many times is demonstrated through our actions. And wisdom, likewise, is demonstrated through our actions. How does somebody know you're a wise man? Well, how do you live? What do you say? What do you do? What decisions do you make? And so uh, for you just to proclaim yourself to be a wise man, that's not good enough. When God gave Solomon all the wisdom that he needed to have, you remember Solomon was a young man who was taken over from his father David as being the king. And God came to him one night and he said, I will give you whatever you want. And Solomon could have asked for riches. He could have asked for power. He could have asked for anything in the world. And the one thing he asked for, he said, Lord, I need wisdom. I'm being given a responsibility. I'm a young man. I don't know how to take care of, of the business of this kingdom that you've given me, and I need wisdom. God was so pleased with his request that not only did he give him wisdom, he gave him more wisdom than anybody had ever received. Mm -hmm. And with the wisdom, God said, I'm also good. Even though you didn't ask for riches and power and every, wealth and everything else, I'm giving you that too. Amen. Wisdom. Well, how do you know that Saul was a wise man? Shortly thereafter, two women came to him, both harlots, unfortunately, carrying a, a baby. And they said that they were in bed, they were asleep, both of them had their babies in bed with them. They woke up, one baby was dead. They both said, this is my baby, the one baby that's alive is my baby. And so Solomon had to demonstrate wisdom. He couldn't just say, well, you know, there was no DNA test back in those days. There, there was no way that scientifically that he could have proved who that child belonged to. And so the wisdom that God gave him all of a sudden kicked in. And, and he said, fine, give me a sword. And I'll cut this baby right in half, the living baby, and I'll give one half to you, one half to the other. And the one mother said, fine, I'll take half the baby. The other mother said, no, no. I'd rather you give the child to that mom. Well, she was the real mom because a real mom would rather give away that child than have it split in half and kill. How'd he come up with that idea? Wisdom. Wisdom is proved. You just come up with these ideas. You come up with answers. You come up with solutions. And all of a sudden, you figure things out that maybe you didn't think you could figure out. Wisdom produces good actions. Now look at verse 13 again. 
Let him show out of a good conversation. Now, the word conversation in our King James Version of the Bible uh, is better translated. Uh, as we think of conversation, we think of talking, which conversation is. But this word conversation goes more than just talking. And it gives the idea of not only what you speak, but your entire behavior, how you act. And so if we look at that, the word conversation is your manner of life. And so let's break down this, this, this idea of actions show our wisdom. Well, first off, um, how you speak shows whether you're a wise person or not. Have you ever been around somebody that's really dumb, very foolish? It doesn't take too long for you to figure out, boy, that, his elevator doesn't go away to the top floor. Something wrong with that guy. You know, he says stupid things. You know, it, it, you know the Bible says, and I quoted this verse, uh, I think it was last week, that even a, even a fool, when he keeps his mouth shut, is considered wise. If you don't want people to know you're a fool, you know what you do? You just shut up. It's real simple. Because as soon as you open up your mouth, that's foolish. Now, if we use words that are of wisdom, we show it through our speech. So, for example, when uh, uh, you're, you're faced with questions or faced with uh, uh, problems, and all of a sudden now uh, you give answers that are godly answers, you prove that you have wisdom. Now, how do you get godly answers? Wouldn't it be wonderful if God gave us a book with a lot of answers in it? Oh, yeah, he did. It's called the Bible, right? Do you read the Bible, though, or do you just carry it to church or carry it on your phone and, you, you know, on Sunday, look up the Bible? This Word of God is chock full of answers and solutions and biblical principles that will help you every day in life. And if you just start reading the Bible and meditating and studying it, all of a sudden now your speech will change because what's in your heart, as we talked about last week, comes out. And if you have biblical knowledge in your heart, then it comes out. You just say things that are wise because you've been studying the Bible. And so you know how to comfort people. You know how to say the right words. You know how to encourage people. You know how to rebuke people when they, need, when they need a rebuke. You know how to challenge people and exhort people. You know how to speak to your spouse properly. You know how to treat your children and not uh, you know, mistreat your children through your words. If you're a wise person, when you go to work and you speak, people around you realize, you know, that guy, he knows what he's talking about. And so your speech is one way in which you display whether you have wisdom or not. By the way, how you respond to tragedy. We go back to uh, Job. <clears throat> you remember Job lost his 10 children. Job lost his wealth. Job's, Job lost his health. And unfortunately, his wife said a dumb thing. Now, I, I know she was stressed out. I'm not going to get on Mrs. Job today. She was a good woman. She lost it all too. By the way, we talk about how Job lost it. Well, she lost everything too. There were her 10 kids too. They were, that was her possessions too. And, and, but she came up with a bad idea. She said, why don't you just curse God and die? And Job had to say, now you're speaking like a foolish woman. Because Job had walked with God and Job had studied the scripture, you know, whatever limited scripture he may have had and whatever knowledge he had. And so he took those things that he had learned and what does he do? He speaks properly. He realizes, and the Bible says in all these things, God, uh, Job never charged God foolishly. When tragedy strikes, when suffering comes, do you all of a sudden say dumb things about God? I've people, I heard people say, well, why does God do this? Say, well, why me? And, well, why would God, who loves me, allow these things? Listen, that's foolish talk. You understand that? When you understand who God is, you don't question God. You may not understand him, but you don't question God. You may not want to see what God is doing or, or appreciate all the things he's doing or letting things happen in your life, but you don't talk foolish things back to God. That comes from studying the scripture and knowing that, listen, we serve a God whose ways are higher than our ways, whose knowledge sur surpasses any knowledge we have. And we trust in a God who's omnipotent and omniscient. So how do you speak? How else do you show your, your, uh, your, your, your actions? By, by the decisions you make. Decisions. Um, sometimes people are impulsive. Carefree. I'm just going with my gut. Be careful, your gut. 
may lead you astray. Your heart may lead you astray. You know, that Jeremiah warned, your, your heart is, is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So what decisions you make, sometimes you make poor decisions because you've not spent time in the Word, you've not prayed, you've not got with God, you've not asked God for wisdom, and so all of a sudden you just come up with a decision on the spur of the moment that you regret. A wise man is slow sometimes to make a decision. A wise man gathers the information. A wise man prays. A wise man seeks God. A wise man asks for the Holy Spirit to lead him and guide him before he makes decisions. And so how you make decisions many times determines and shows whether you're wise or not. Have you ever bought something on an impulse? And after you got home, you said, why did I buy that? Now, I'm thankful for many stores allowing you to exchange things. You know that tie you had to have and you put it on, you're like, oh, this is terrible. By the way, if you got a Father's Day tie, Dad, just wear it anyhow, all right? But uh, impulsive, impulsive. Make a quick decision. Quit a job, spur of the moment. Take a job. Uh, you know, uh, try to find a, a partner. Like, yeah, that, that person, they, they look all right. I'll just hurry up. You know, get married. Does not matter. Well, it does matter. All these things matter. How you make decisions determines many times whether you're wise or foolish. Another thing under this is how you raise your family shows whether you're wise or not. Are you providing for your family? Are you raising your kids? Are you teaching? Are you getting them to come to church? I understand we have a pandemic. I appreciate the kids that are here today. And sorry, you don't have junior church. I know junior church is a lot more fun than I am. But maybe in a few, another few weeks or month or so, you know, we, we'll get you back in there again. But uh, it's a good thing to bring our kids to church. It's a good thing. Some of you have sacrificed. You put them in our Christian school or other Christian schools. You're, you're doing what you can to, to try to raise your young kid, rear your children to the glory of God. And uh, Proverbs 22, verse 6 says this, Train up a child in the way he should go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. A wise man says, this is a gift I have from God. I can't be too busy for that, my gift that God gave me. I can't be too indifferent or too passive. I must invest in my child's life. I must every day be involved teaching and training and giving them biblical principles and preparing them for the day in which they're going to fly the coop. I was telling you the other week, uh, I, I put up a fern. I got a fern from, you know, I was on sale, I put it up, hung it up in our front porch there. About a day or two later, a bird claimed that. He made his little nest right in front of the door. So as soon as I'd come in the door, he'd fly away. I'd leave, I'd leave the house, he'd fly away, he'd come back is the big guy gone? Okay, I'll go back again. <laughs> had his little, had his little baby. His little, I don't, I don't even know what happened in there. But anyhow, I know he had something. Little baby chicks, and they flew away, and, and within a few weeks, they're all gone. It doesn't seem like when you have kids, within a few weeks, they're already grown up. They're already gone. Let's think about my son, thirty-five years old. How can I? How can I have a kid thirty-five years? I don't know. Some of you are saying, Pastor, you only look 39, which is when you're four years old, right? <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. your love. I can feel it. And your laughter showed me you really don't think that. But anyhow, they fly away so quickly. They're gone. Take the gift that God gives you, those who still have young children in the nest. And uh, uh, a man of wisdom will invest, not be too busy. And, you know, if you can't play in a softball league, but you spend time with your kid, I think in the, in the long run, what you made that decision was a lot better. If you couldn't go hang out with the guys and go watch TV and, and, and watch your football game, but you spent time investing in your kids and you came to all their games and you, you were there and you cheered them on and you brought them to church and you did everything so that those years, those formative years were valuable. You laid a foundation so that when that little bird flew away, you gave him a good foundation to fly away on him. <clears throat> In Proverbs, I'm sorry, Ephesians 6 verse 4, it says, Your fathers provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture 
and admonition of the Lord. When you have a spirit of wisdom, you're not ruling your kids where they're mad at you all the time and they're frustrated and they're saying, oh, I just can't wait till I leave the house. Listen, if you're, if, you're, if you're on your kids without a relationship, what happens is that you drive them away. They, they, don't, they don't value you. They don't value your opinions. They don't value uh, what you're giving them. And so every day you have, day, you have, you have an opportunity to teach them. I remember when, when Eric was a small kid, we were, we were uh, I was driving a bus somewhere, he and I, I hey, he loved, he liked it when I'd drive the bus, hey, can I come with you? You know, it's a big thing for a kid to ride in a bus, you know, and uh, we were going somewhere, and, and, you know, hard to believe, but it broke down, the bus broke down. <laughs> Thank God we have some good buses now, but, you know, back in the day, they lasted about a year, and that was it, you know, and, uh, uh, it broke down, and, and I'm trying to start. It would not start. And, and my son, I don't know, he was maybe 10 years old at that time. Looks at me, he says, Dad, why don't we just pray? <laughs> what a novel idea. Don't call a mechanic. Don't tow it. Just pray. I said, oh, man, Lord, my son asked me to pray. Lord, you got to do something. Lord, help us with this bus. And I kid you not, God showed up that day and cranked and boom, started right up. Wow. I guess uh, he was paying attention and he taught me a lesson that day. Your, your wisdom is shown. Your wisdom is shown by how you spend your money. Do you budget your money or do you waste your money? Is your money all gone real quickly? Is your money, you know, you're giving it away, you're gambling, you're buying booze, cigarettes, and things are not going to be helpful to your life, wasting it, and then you don't have enough money. I don't, oh, I'd like to tithe. I'd like to give the missions, but we just don't make enough money. You know, that didn't stop the widow from giving her two mites, did it? We just don't. It's not about making enough money. It's about managing the money you have. And a man of wisdom realizes that if I give my tithe to God somehow, that 90% lasts a lot longer. And by the way, we appreciate all of you that have been tithing faithfully during the pandemic, even when you haven't showed up to church. And by the way, we have an offering box there and out there for those of you that are <laughs> looking for the boxes. The truth is, a man of wisdom realizes that I must give to God, honor God with my, with my first fruits. That's wisdom. And you teach your kids. You have $10, you give a dollar to the Lord. You have $100, you're giving 10 to the Lord. And, as a, and what you're doing is you're training, you're showing wisdom. And all of a sudden your kids realize, you know, when I give to the Lord, it seems like we always had enough. It seems like that old car just kept on going. The truth is that we show whether we're wise or not by our finances. And uh, if you have, uh, if you're a man of wisdom, you know, you, you don't have, you, you're not always without. God somehow always is supplying your need because you're using what God has given you properly. My kids learned that, listen, you, you, you work, you save, you're gonna help pay for college, and you know, and, and, and they did, I mean, you know, they. Uh, you know, they worked jobs, they saved, you know, they, they paid their way. And, and that's not to mean that I, I couldn't help or didn't want to help or certainly did at times. But, you know, I wanted to appreciate what they had. Appreciate what they have rather than here, just here, here's, you know, here's college tuition, go, you know, go have a party. The value, the wise man is trying to, to spend properly and show his family that also I have to hurry up. Uh, and then how do you deal with trials in life? In James 1, 2 through 5, talks about how that if you have trials, what do you do? You pray for wisdom. When you go through trials in life, it's a display, am I wise or not? How I respond to trials. And then ultimately, how your actions are. If you're a wise person, you're a testimony to the lost. You think a lost person wants to end up being a fool? Do you think a lost person is going to look at your life and say, that guy's a wreck. I want to be just like him. Look, he, 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 his life is a wreck. His kids are a wreck. His, his finances are a wreck. 
He says stupid things. I'm going to ask Jesus to be my Savior so I can be just like him. No. They watch us. And you, when you proclaim you're a Christian, they want to see what you're all about. How do you respond in crisis? How do you treat people? How do you spend your money? How do you raise your kids? These are all the things that you're showing the unsaved person. And if they see that you're a wise person, many times they will be drawn to your Christ, not repelled from your Christ. And so how you spend your life is an example to them. So you show your wisdom. The second thing I share with you this morning is this. Wisdom comes down from, from, from God. Verse 14, it says, but if you have bitter ending and strife in your hearts, and we're going to talk about verse 14, 15 next week more, so we're going to kind of skip over this, uh, and, and uh, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. Two types of wisdom. Earthly wisdom, heavenly wisdom. Look at verse 17. But the wisdom that is from above do you understand that God is the source of all wisdom? Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10 says this, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy is understanding. You don't get wisdom until you get to know God. And somebody could have all the education, and they could have all the accumulation of facts, and understand maybe uh, intricate details about things. But wisdom is not about the accumulation of facts. Wisdom is about how to use what you know. And some of the most foolish people are the smartest people in the world that have a lot of intellect and a high IQ, but they don't know how to use it. When you have wisdom, what happens now, you get it from God. So people that deny God and people that are, uh, believe in evolution and think, you know, we are not accountable to God and people that are agnostic and atheistic or people that have no faith, they don't, they're not connected to the source of wisdom. And so understand that God is all wise. Now, you think maybe if I could connect with God, he'd give me some of that wisdom? You think maybe if I hung around God, some of his wisdom would rub off on me? Do you think maybe if I studied his word and I got to know him, all of a sudden wisdom now comes from down from above. He is the source of all wisdom. The more time I spend with God, the wiser I can be. Do you understand that? The more time you spend with God, the wiser you will be. Now, here's what the devil does. As bro I miss Brother Charles. He's not here. He'd, always, he'd be giving me half my sermon. But he always tells me, oh, the devil, he's a busy, he's a busy old guy. He is. And you know what? He, makes, he tries to make us busy. You know why? We have so many things that, that occupy. We have TV. We have cable. You're going cable. You got. You have like five thousand channels. Uh, none of them are worth anything. But you have five thousand channels. You have the internet. You can go through the internet. You, you. We ever reach the end of the internet? I don't know. You have information. You have Facebook. You have Instagram. You have Twitter. You have all this social media. You have, you have, listen, there's so much out there to keep up with. People are so busy keeping up with everybody else and, 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 and uh, making sure that they, they've watched every show and every sports event that there is, that they forget to take time to spend with God. Now, you know every team that won and all the statistics and you know what everybody's posting on their Facebook and you've read everybody's Instagram and you've been on Pinterest, and I'm not against these things, but what I'm saying is that sometimes they are a time waster that causes you not to spend time with the one who has wisdom, and you now have been around a bunch of foolishness. And what happens? You become like those that you're around. God is the source of all wisdom. You see... Proverbs 13, verse 20 says this, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. If I walk with wise men, I will be wise. Well, who's wiser than God? If I walk with God, I, I glean his wisdom, but if I walk with fools, I glean their foolishness. 
So you pretty much determine whether you're going to be wise or not by how you spend your time. And if you're going to spend your time with God in prayer and meditation and scripture and reading it around other good Christians and in church and, and you're doing all the things to, to get your mind in the right frame of mind, now all of a sudden you have wisdom from above. Do you know that the fish, the, the, the apostles were common, ordinary men? I don't know if any of them were educated much. I know Matthew had to be educated since he was a, he was a tax collector. But, but Peter, James, John, Andrew, four fishermen. These men were not highly educated. In fact, when after Jesus died and they preached the gospel and they carried on the message, the people marveled and they said, are not these fishermen, are they not ignorant and unlearned fishermen? How do they know all these things? Because they've been with Jesus. They didn't need to go to college. They were three years with Jesus. They didn't need to, to uh, study any, under any seminary prep professor or any Pharisee or Sadducee of the day. They were with Jesus, and because they were with Jesus, they had great wisdom and knowledge, even though they were ignorant, unlearned men. And so we spend time. Now, how do you get wisdom that comes from above? Well, how do you get anything from God? You ask. The next passage we're going to look at next week is, you have not because you ask not. James 1.5, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth all men liberally and upbraideth not. If you don't have wisdom, you know whose fault it is? It's your own fault. If you're a big dummy, sorry to call you that, none of you, of course, here are, or you're listening on Facebook are, but if, if you don't have, if you're foolish, it's because you didn't ask for wisdom. Now, I don't want you to raise your hand today, but how many of you today whisper to prayer, Lord, give me wisdom? I, I, but I, I want to ask you, would you consider doing that every day? He upbraideth not. He doesn't, well, you just asked me for wisdom yesterday. How much more do you need? He gives it liberally. Means that you need it today, I'll give you more wisdom. You need it tomorrow, I'll give you some more. You need it next day, I'll give you. Dad, you need wisdom today? Yeah. Your kids are eight. But when they turn 12, you're going to need a different type of wisdom. And when they turn 16, you're really going to need wisdom. You understand how throughout life you need more wisdom? <clears throat> so what do you do? You pray. If any of you lack wisdom, Lord, here I'm back again. I know I was here yesterday. But yesterday's wisdom is worn off. I need some new wisdom. You pray for wisdom every day. Every day. And it comes. The last statement I give is this. Wisdom has godly characteristics. Now, there are seven things, and, and because of time, we're not going to be able to go into all of them in depth, and we're going to just kind of give you about a minute apiece for each and every one of them. Uh, but look at verse number 17. But wisdom that is from above is first pure. There are seven characteristics of wisdom. The first one, it's pure. Now the word pure means without spot, without blemish, without stain. I looked at my house recently and I said, man, I look like I live in a jungle. My, there's moss all over my house. My one side, entire green, it's all green. Now it's supposed to be gray, but it's green. My roof, moldy, green. My back, concrete, black. I'm like, what am I doing? Wash this dumb house, you know? So I went online, figured out, you know, I have a pressure washer, me and someone else were pressure washing everything, and found this great stuff you shoot up on the walls, and all the LG's gone. I was up on a roof scraping and spraying, and gave my house a once over because it had a bunch of stain on it. It wasn't pure, it didn't look like it should have looked. And what happens as we go through life, we have stains and we have uh, you know, wrong ideas and, and layers of bitterness or anger or greed or whatever else is, is making our life look moldy and stained up and we gotta kinda go to the pressure washer and the elder side and everything else to, to get rid of these things. And see, wisdom makes you pure now. All of a sudden, you have pure heart and pure motives. You're not stained by the world. It's pure. It's pure. The Holy Spirit power washes us, our hearts. Matthew 5, 8 says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. 
Notice the second word it says here, not only is, pure, is wisdom pure, but it's peaceable. If you're always getting in fights and arguments and strife and challenging people and always mad and upset about, I, I, this, this one person always tells me, well, I don't go to that store, I'm, I'm against them, and I don't go to this store because I, I have an issue with them, and, and yeah, I don't go there because I'm like, why do you get in arguments with everybody, everybody you go to, everywhere you go? When you're, when you're a wise person, you're not always fighting people and mad and aggravated and, and you know, you're peaceable. You live in peace with people. Listen, I, we all, I talked about this last week. We all get offended. People say things to us. We offend people, unfortunately. But when you have wisdom, you don't take offense. When you have wisdom, you don't offend. You live peaceably with people. Now, that doesn't mean you compromise. It doesn't mean you give in. It doesn't mean you change your, your, your doctrinal positions just to, so you don't offend somebody or, or live peacefully. You still can have your convictions, your beliefs in the Word of God, your standards, everything you need, but you, you do it in a, in a fashion where you can live peaceably with people. And so true wisdom, you're not, you're not fighting. You don't have strife, bitter envy like the previous verse says. The third thing it says, if you have true wisdom, you're gentle. Wasn't Jesus gentle? Suffer the little children to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of God. The disciples would come and they'd say dumb things. And he, oh, you have little faith. I don't think he was scolding them in a mean spirit. I think in a gentle spirit, he's saying, oh, you have little faith. When I think of Jesus, I think of, of a savior who's gentle. And when you have wisdom, you have a spirit of gentleness. Now, gentleness does not mean that you're wimpy or that you're a pushover or people are going to take advantage of you. It just shows that what happens is that you understand that my life must reflect Jesus. And Jesus had a spirit of gentleness about it. He was kind. He was compassionate. He was merciful. Proverbs 15 verse 1 says this, a soft answer turns away wrath. That's a spirit of gentleness. When was the last time when someone blessed you out and you blessed them back out? Listen, wait a minute. A soft answer. That's, a that's wisdom. Notice the next thing. It's, it's not e easily entreated. That means you're submissive. When you have wisdom, that means you submit. Submit? What do you mean? It means you're teachable. You know, some people are hard-headed and stubborn and you can't teach me anything. You're not a wise person. Every person can teach you something. You know that? Everybody can help you to become the person you need to be. And so, instead of thinking you have all the answers, why don't you ask questions? And why don't you glean from what other people have? Their knowledge. That's a, that's a person of wisdom. You're, you submit. And you admit when you're wrong. You admit when you've done things. When, when you have wrong ideas or, or made wrong decisions. You're not too proud. You're not easily entreated. You're, you submit. And then notice you're merciful, full of mercy and good fruits. Isn't God merciful? If you're saved today, it's by his mercy. Mercy means that I'm going to forgive. I'm not going to hold people all the time to, to, what, to, to some certain standard. I'm going to be merciful. Wisdom means that I'm going to be compassionate, sympathetic. When Jesus met people... You know, the only people he scolded were the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders of the day. But everybody else, he was merciful to them. And he had been merciful to the, uh, to, to the Pharisees. He was to Nicodemus. But we have to realize that when I treat people with mercy, compassion, kindness, love, forgiveness, that's a spirit of wisdom. And then notice it says, without partiality. That means I don't respect a person based on their skin color or their nationality or their intellectual level. And we talked about this in a previous passage of scripture. No respect or I treat everybody the same. Wisdom doesn't have different rules for different people. We're all, we're, we're all created by God, are we not? No matter if we have different skin color or different uh, language or, or, or different culture, it doesn't matter. And so wisdom says, I treat everybody right. And I don't hold some people in a high regard and I treat them to one degree and then I hold other people to a low degree and I treat them differently. And so wisdom is without partiality. Last thing, wisdom is without hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. 
Wisdom simply means, like we mentioned last week with the tongue, two things, two things can't come out of the tongue. A, a fountain can't bring forth a bitter and sweet water. A tree can't have two different fruits. And what's it saying is that you're, when you are wise, you don't say one thing and do something else. You don't, you don't, you're, you're not hypocritical. You don't change based on who you're around. You're not a chameleon. You're, you're the same person no matter what. True wisdom. Now, I hope this morning you ask yourself the question, am I a wise man? Dads, we need to be wise. Moms, you need to be wise. Grandparents, we need to show forth wisdom. Uh, kids, you need to grow up and be a wise young person. We all need wisdom. And so how do we have wisdom? We, we prove our wisdom by our actions. So let's start showing that we're wise, realizing all wisdom comes from heaven. I got to get a hold of God. And then when he, when I, he gives me wisdom, he gives me these characteristics now that we just shared. And I hope and pray that each and every one of us will truly be men and women of wisdom. Shall we pray? Father, thank you today for the time to share your word. Help us all to be men and wisdom, men and, and women of wisdom. As our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Dads, how many would say, a Pastor, pray for me. I want to be a wise father in my household. Would you raise your hand today and just, just ask God to bless you and help you to have wisdom? Moms, likewise. Kids, likewise. Everybody, who wants more wisdom? Would you raise your hand before the Lord and say, Lord, give me more wisdom in life. As we think about wisdom today, let's realize that we show every day whether we're wise or we're foolish. The words we say, the actions, the, the decisions, how we spend our money, how we treat our kids, how we work at, at our jobs, all these things are different ways in which we show our wisdom. We realize that our wisdom is a testimony, whether it's good or bad testimony to others. With our, as our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, maybe there's somebody here today you're not saved, you're not sure that you're on your way to heaven. You have a heavenly Father who loves you, who sent his son Jesus to die for you. And if you're not saved today, why don't you call out to Jesus and say, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose again. I believe you are my, are my Savior. Save my soul and take me to heaven. This morning, you have any other prayer requests, why don't you bring it to God? Father, thank you now for this time we could share your word. Help us now. Bless all of our dads, especially today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being here today. We hope the service was a blessing to you. And uh, we hope to see you Wednesday night and next Sunday. We still have some seats available. So if you're not out yet, come on out next Sunday. And uh, God bless you. Thank you to those who have been watching on Facebook. We're going to say goodbye to you. And uh, then we'll say goodbye to our people. Thank you, folks, for being here.